once again I greet you in the name of the Lord everyone praise the Lord it's another chance uh, God has enabled us to see another day and wake up and uh, glorify his name in this uh, morning we continue with the series of higher calling and uh, we are dealing uh, today and this hour with the uh, kingly religion at this moment we are dealing with uh, the topic a uh, uh, kingly religion and uh, so i welcome all of us to share together in the blessings of the lord let us pray heavenly father we thank you for this morning we thank you for the gladness that you put in our hearts even as we wake up in the morning to glorify thy name thank you for the birds of the air as they praise thee that we may join in the throne to exalt thy name and father let uh, not the morning man be missed by us because of our indulgence in sleep but father help us to celebrate together in the morning with the birds of the air with the angels as they i wake to do thy duties and to praise thy name thank you for thy love and thy guidance and father we thank you because you have never tired to reach and to ask for salvation the angels which do not sleep nor tire to minister to us are always by our side protecting us through the night and lord guiding us during the day and so we pray that every word and everything that we shall do today may be to glorify your name and not self it is in jesus name we pray amen uh, we are looking at the series uh, our higher calling and uh, i want us to look at something uh, to do with the kingly religion god is calling us to be his children and be like jesus christ when christ was on the earth the apostles were jostling for power and uh, there's a time that uh, they started arguing among them who shall be the great among them and christ told them that it should not be so among them because the rulers of the world do such a thing but such a thing should not be among them whoever wants to be uh, the the master should serve the others and so i, I like to look at uh, as Christ is calling us to sit at his feet and be able to be at his side and educated by him and to do his biddings what is this calling is he having upon us he is having a calling uh, upon us in this higher calling is what uh, we are looking at and more so i want to look at uh, how we, we have been looking at uh, how we can be able to attain this higher calling and uh, one of the things that are impeding our higher calling is a king religion that exists amongst god's people a kingly religion that exists among god's people is one of the impediments it is one of the causes that is uh, making us not uh, have a uh, experience this higher calling and so uh, Many Protestants suppose that the Catholic religion is unattractive and that its worship is dull, meaningless round of ceremonies. Here they mistake. While Romanism is based upon deception, it is not a coarse and clumsy imposture. The religious service of the Roman Church is a most impressive religion, impressive ceremonial. It is gorgeous display and solemn rites fascinate the senses of the people and silence the voice of reason and of conscience the eye is charmed magnificent churches imposing processions golden altars jewel shrine choice paintings and exquisite sculptural appeal to the love of beauty the ear is also captivated the music unsurpassed the rich notes of the deep toned organ blending with the melody of many voices as it sways through the lofty domes and pillars at isles uh, of her grand cathedrals cannot fail to impress the mind with awe and reverence this outward splendor pomp and ceremony that only mocks the longings of the sin soul is all an evidence of an inward corruption the religion of christ needs not such attraction to recommend it in the light shining from this the cross the the true christianity appears so pure and lovely that no external decorations can enhance it is worth it is the beauty of holiness a meek and quiet spirit which is of value with god and so uh, 
there, there can be a religion which is focused in uh, uh, outward uh, shining. It is focused on outward shining, but actually inside it is a, a rotten uh, religion. You can find that this is the uh, this is what the situation of many people find themselves in. This is the situation that uh, uh, many people find themselves in in a religion which has an uh, outward form, but the inward is uh, corrupted. The inward is actually. Uh, uh, filled with bitterness, filled with envy, filled with with, with, with jealousy. And so um, people, instead of uh, having Christ in them, in this religion, what they all do is try to enforce things. And uh, We are told trial and persecution will come to all who, in obedience to the word of God, refuse to worship this false Sabbath. False is the last of every false religion. If you find yourself that you are uh, forcing out things, you just understand that you are in a false religion, because you are told that false, uh, false is the uh, is the last resort of every false religion. At first, it, at first it tries attraction, as the king of Babylon tried the power of music and outward show. If this attraction invaded by men inspired by certain failed to make men worship the image, the hungry flames of the furnace were ready to consume them. So it will be now. So the principle I want you to get there is that uh, force is the last resort of every false religion. Uh, the children of God should not have such a character of uh, forcing things out, forcing people to see things the way they would want them to see. We can have a spirit of Rome and the truth of advancing. When these two cross, what do you have? You have a cold-blooded, calculate, calculating Pharisee with all the answers, but with no joy, no peace, no power, and their religious life is one mere round of drudgery and sadness. And so ask yourself, is this kind of religion that um, you practice, are you an Adventism having the spirit of Rome? You have an outward appearance, but inside it is rotten. You have the intellectual part and the theoretical part of truth, but you don't have the practical aspect of truth. You are a whited sepulchre. You are a Pharisee who is much concerned with how you appear in the outside, and yet the inside has nothing. And... Uh, what was the problem with the ancient Israel? The law given upon Sinai was the uh, inundation of the principle of love, a revelation to us of the law of heaven. It was ordained in the hand of mediator spoken by him through whose power the hearts of men could be brought into harmony with its um, principles. God had revealed the purpose of the law when he decided to Israel, ye shall be holy men unto me. Ye shall be holy men unto me. And so, this is the law that was given at Sinai was uh, to reveal the principle of love. In fact, the law is based on love. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor with all your heart. Let me give me some power. My power is going off. Yes, and so, but Israel had not perceived the spiritual nature of the law, and too often their professed obedience was but an observance of forms and ceremonies, rather than a surrender of the heart to the sovereignty of love. As Jesus in his character and work represented to men the holy, benevolent, and paternal attributes of God, and presented the worthlessness of mere ceremonies of ceremonial obedience, the Jewish leaders did not receive or understand his words. They thought that he dwelt too lightly upon the requirements of the law, and when he said before them the very truth that were the soul of their divinely appointed service, they, looking only at the external, accused him of seeking to overthrow it. And so, 
you find that uh, uh, Christ came to reveal the law of God and the law of God is based on love. That is the principles of the law of God. It's based on love and it's not uh, based on forcing uh, a religion on anyone. It's not based on uh, forcing a religion on anyone but um, the ancient Israel didn't understand actually the meaning of the law. The rabbis counted their righteousness as a passport to heaven, but Jesus declared it to be insufficient and unworthy. External ceremonies and a theoretical knowledge of truth constituted pharisaical righteousness. The rabbis claimed to be holy through their own efforts in keeping the law, but their works had divorced righteousness from religion while they were Pantilius in ritual observances, their lives were immoral and debased. Their so-called righteousness could never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest deception of the human mind is in Christ's day was that a mere ascent to the truth constitutes righteousness. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. It does not bring forth the fruits of righteousness. A jealous a regard for what is termed theological truth of them accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in life. The darkest chapters of history are burdened with the record of crimes committed by bigoted religionists. The Pharisees claimed to be children of Abraham and boasted of their possession of the oracles of God, yet these advantages did not preserve them from selfishness, malignity, greed for gain, and the basest hypocrisy. They thought themselves the greatest religionists of the world, but their so-called orthodoxy led them to crucify the Lord of glory. The same danger still exists today, where people will want to practice a legal kingly religion so that all people may be under them and under the uh, interpretation of what they deem as truth. And uh, this is how we deal with other people. This is how we deal with each other. Uh, in this kingly and uh, legal religion. You look at it. So what if we have the truth, but we deny the truth by the hateful spirit which we represent it? What if we have the truth, but we deny it by the cruel harsh words we use to defend it? We are utterly orthodox in our doctrine, but crucify the truth by the imp impatient, domineering spirit we manifest to uphold it. Does Christ need such a spirit to exonerate him? We love the truth and argue about it, protecting the letter of the law, but deny the spirit of the law and crucify Christ by our heartless spirit that bruises the people we will class as heathen. You, you, you can look at how the man is responding and how the woman is responding to these things. This is how we deal with the religion in our lives. This is how we want. Everyone wants to be a queen. Everyone wants to be a king. And so no one wants to be a Christian. They, there is a mere profession of religion, but actually there is no practical aspect of it. There is no practical aspect of it. And uh, listen to this counsel. Your wife does not venture to open her heart to you, for as soon as he utters a sentiment different from you, you repel it. You talk so strong that she has no courage to say another word. You are not one in heart. You take a position above her and maintain a, be a bearing as though her judgment and opinion were of no account. You consider your spiritual attainments far an advance of hers. My brother, you do not know yourself. God looks at the heart, not at the words of or possession. The externals do not weigh with God as with men. A humble heart and a contrite spirit, God values. Our Savior is acquainted with the life conflicts of every soul. He judgeth not according to appearances, but righteously. Your spirit is strong. When you take a position, you do not weigh the matter well and consider what must be the effect of your maintaining your views in independent manner weaving them into your prayers and conversation when you know that your wife does not hold the same views that you do instead of respecting the feeling of your wife and kindly avoiding as a gentleman would those subjects upon which you know you differ you have been forward to dwell upon objectionable points and have manifested a persistent in expressing your views regarding of any around you you have felt that others had no right to see matters different from yourself. These fruits do not grow upon the Christian tree. In the case of Sister Anne, you did not view things in her true light. 
if ye had been healed in answer to the prayer of yourself and others, if it will have proved the ruin of more than two or three of you. A wise God has oversight of this matter. He could read the motives and purpose of the heart. Your wife has just as much right of opinion as you have to us. Her marriage related does not destroy her identity. She has an individuality, uh, an individual responsibility. You will not feel clear till you take things out of her way and manifest toward her a mere charitable Christ-like spirit of forbearance and regard others in the light in which you wish to be regarded. You have yet to learn to let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one uh, another. Not slothful uh, in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Two, uh, that is testimonies to the church, volume 2, page 418 and 409. And uh, so, so you find that uh, that even this man, the things that he differed with the wife, instead of respecting the feelings of the wife, what he did is even brought these things in prayer. And so what kind of prayer is this? That actually the things you have differed with your wife, you bring them into the prayer. This domineering spirit is what we are talking about, a kingly power among us, so that you are the one who is hard and nothing else should be hard. You are always right and you want everyone to be under you. Such a kingly power doesn't make a Christian. It is a, a mere formal of Christianity. It is pharisaical Christianity and not a Christianity that um, actually um, reveals uh, God in our lives. I'm joined with my man. Come on, this way. Yes, and so such a religion should not be found amongst uh, Christians. And uh, in such a kingly power and in such a spirit, this is what you find. Uh, you, you will be a person who hates everything. Men profess faith in the truth, but it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavenly minded. It is a curse to its possessors, and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. The righteousness which Christ taught is conformity of heart and life to the revealed will of God. Sinful men can become righteous only as they have faith in God and maintain a vital connection with him. But if you are a person who is seeking for kingly power, if you are a person who is domineering, you, you will always be a person who is uh, who hates everything. There is nothing that goes your way, but you always see that it should have been done this like this, or it shall be. It should have been done this way. Uh, this way, such a spirit is actually a kingly spirit that is not found. It's a spirit of lordship, which Christ says that it should not be amongst you, and it embeds our higher calling. Is this how you defend the truth? And you can see the two bulls. The the other bull actually is down already. But uh, the other one is going it still. This is how we treat others even who don't have the truth. This is how we deal with the truth. And uh, what follows is just accusation, blame, and, uh, and uh, abuses. If, that is, if, if this is the spirit that is in heaven, why would one, anyone want to be there if this is how we shall treat the truth and how we shall treat each other in this uh, uh, religion? Ephesians chapter 5. You can go ahead and read. Husbands, love your wives. Just on the screen. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And, and then people take these positions, 
and then they remember not to read this. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such a thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wife as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So uh, we are given an analogy of husband and wife in Christ and the church. And how did Christ love the church? He loved the church to the point that he was ready to die for it. Is this how husbands love? Is this how they treat their wives? Is this how we behave with those whom we want uh, to be in truth? And does it mean submitting? If the Bible says that somebody should submit to you, it means that now you are a king or a lord over that person. These are the things that uh, we should be looking at. This is about reforming the women. This is about our duty and privilege to our wives. Our responsibility is husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How much love did Christ show for his child? How far did he go? How much was he willing to give for us? How many tally, uh, sheets did he keep toward us? I found that uh, the love of Christ upon us actually should uh, propel men to go just beyond being the masters of the house, but um, providing the environment necessary for uh, a people who are erring. Say an example, you came home and you found this is how the, your house looks like. How do you behave in such a scenario? Romans chapter 5 verse 8. If you came at your home as a husband and found your house is in, in, in such a way, what will you do? Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commanded, commanded his love towards us in that while we are we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, so if, if you find situations, if you find a person in such a state, what do you think of this person? Is this person uh, gone mad? Is this person actually out of their minds? Are they idling or are they... What are your first thoughts when you find your house in such a, a way and maybe you find situations like this? Will even a scripture cross your mind, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or will you like to show how you are right and the other person is wrong? How they are looking so bad that um, they can't be accepted. We are talking about a kingly religion, a legal religion that has no Christ in it. And it is in the series, Our Higher Calling. How did Christ behave with sinners? How did he even deal with his erring disciples? 21 MR 215, 3. Husbands should be careful, attentive, constant, faithful, and compassionate. They should manifest love and sympathy. If they fulfill the words of Christ, their love will not be of a base, earthly, sensual character that will lead to the destruction of their own bodies and bring upon their wives debility and disease. Disease. They will not indulge in the gratification of the best passions while ringing in their ears of their wives that they must be subject to their to their husbands in everything. Continue. When the husband when the husband has the nobility of character, purity of heart, elevation of mind that every true Christian must possess, it will be made manifest in the marriage relation. If he has the mind of Christ, it will not be a destroyer of the body, but will be full of tender, tender love, seeking to reach the highest standard in Christ. He will seek to keep his wife in health and encourage. Encourage. He will strive to speak words of comfort to create an atmosphere of peace in the home circle. If the husband is a tyrannical, exacting, critical of actions of his wife, he cannot 
hold her respect and affection and the marriage relation will become odious to her. She will not love her husband because he does not try to make himself lovable. The Lord Jesus has not been correctly represented in his relation to the church by many husbands in their relation to their wives, for they do not keep the way of the Lord. They declare that their wives must be subject to them in everything. And so this last paragraph is so important that uh, we are not just speaking about a husband and wife, but we are speaking of the relation of Christ and the church. And if you can deal with your wife, in such a way as Christ deals with his church, you are not just misrepresenting Christ at home, but you are imperiling the church of God. This kingly and legal religion actually is a misrepresentation of what Christ has instituted to represent a symbol of the church and Christ. The marriage is a symbol of Christ and the church. And when you can't practice such a noble character at home, even the same thing are carried into the church and then you misrepresent the character of Christ. And uh, one of the things that imperial marriage is when people think that their marriage was a mistake and think that they should have never married the person they are with. And uh, forcing submissiveness and uh, thinking that the person that you are married to is so much unchristian that you could have thought of marrying. And if the person you are married to is so unchristian, is it not your first duty then to be a missionary to that person so that you may present that soul to Christ in heaven? And so it is because we like things to be done our way. We like things to be rulers and not to be servants. That is why we have this kingly spirit. This is why we don't care about what we do, but we only care what other people do. This is what we are told in 21 MR 216, paragraph 5. Let those who stand as husbands study the words of Christ, not to find out how complete must be the subjection of the wife, but how he may have the mind of Christ and become purified, refined and fit to be their Lord of his household. All wicked passions must be overcome, and the love which Christ has exercised towards his church must be symbolized in the family circle. Husbands who are husbands indeed and in truth will, not, will do those things which make for peace. The fruit of Christian love will be seen in the courtesy, in the holy tender affection that is manifested in the home. Yes, and so you have to guard your heart. You have to guard what comes from you because uh, th there are many things that are surrounding you. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in, in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. What appears to be harmless glance and so there, there there must be a place that uh, actually we should consider that uh, Christ has not put on us on earth or in his church so that um, we may rule it as the kings of the earth rule nations with an iron rod have you ever thought and considered how the wife was formed she was taken from the rib of a woman uh, of a man a, a, a woman was taken from the rib of a man sorry and uh, if this is the case how do you deal with the, the your own material how do you deal with the your own part that came from your body and as we are looking at this relation of the wife and husband we are looking at the larger aspect of Christ and his church and those who we have left in charge of his church. We are told in Genesis 2, 21 and 22, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which he, the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And the same tenderness 
that um, a man has to exercise upon the wife because it is a part of himself. This is the same that should be extended to the church. The little flocks, the lambs that are there, are to be fed in such a way that they are part of you yourself. And not just strangers who have come together to gather and worship the name of the Lord. But they should be treated as their own kindred, their own brethren. Because this is the church is a family. The church is a representation uh, uh, of uh, the love of Christ upon us. And so as we go about doing the daily duties in the church, as we go about executing our duties, we should think of the tenderness knowing that um, this is like a man and a wife, and the wife was taken from the rib of a man. And so that tenderness should be exercised by those who are in are in charge, uh, uh, in charge of the leadership in church, and uh, what we must look for is uh, mutual submission. In order for there to be a happy home, there must be a mutual submission to one another. There must be giving and talking because there there must be giving and taking because uh, nobody has the entire market on knowing everything. The weaknesses of one can become strength for the family if both parties work together. No one knows everything work together. And uh, this is something that is missing so much in the church. Submission. Submitting to one another and working on mutual basis. Everything is a one showman. Not everyone is included in decision making. Once a person has made a decision, then it should be carried with all the people uh, of the church. Look at this illustration by the in family circle that should be extended to the church, work together. This is from Adventist Home. Neither husband nor wife is to make a plea for rulership. The Lord has laid down the principle that is to guide in this matter. The husband is to cherish his wife as Christ cherishes the church, and the wife is to respect and love her husband. Both are to cultivate the spirit of kindness, being determined never to grieve or injure the other. Do not try to compel each other to do as you wish. You cannot do this and retain each other's love. Manifestations of self will destroy the peace and happiness of the home. Let not your married life be one of the contention. Be one of contention. If you do, you will both be unhappy. Be kind in speech and gentle in action, giving up your own wishes. Watch well your words, for they have a powerful influence for good or for ill. Allow no sharpness to come into your voices. Bring, it, bring into your united life the fragrance of Christ's likeness. likeness. And, and, and yes, so the husband and wife, neither husband nor wife is, is to make a plea for rulership. And the husband is to cherish the wife. And the words that are spoken, the manifestations uh, of self will destroy the peace and happiness of a home. These things we are talking about them because the marriage relation is what should be exercised in the church. Because the, the family is a small church which extends to the larger church where you interact with the people. And uh, the church is a larger family. And so with what you exercise in your home, it should be carried into the church. But if many people are white sepulchers, they, they, they want to show the outside, they, they have the outward show and the inner manifestations of the spirit are not there. And even some would like to behave good at the church and when they are at home, they still have this uh, uh, domineering uh, uh, spirit. They still have this kingly spirit. Admitting strength and weaknesses. And as I said that the church has to work together. Not all one person is excellent in everything. And one of the reasons why actually there is no mutual submission to each other, one man thinks that he is perfect in all things. And in our world, to admit weakness is considered bad wrong. Wives are too smart to think that we are perfect. Men we win and become so strong when they admit weakness in some area of life. Your wife may be an excellent mechanic. Which, mean, which means that 
some other person in the church or in a, what we may call a lesser sphere, which is actually not lesser, a person may be having a knowledge which is more than what you are having, may be good at something more than what you are. And so admitting strength and weaknesses, one of the things that the church imperils the church from it is higher calling is people admitting their weaknesses and uh, allowing others to come in and help where they should be helped. And uh, look at this, it's Ephesians 6, 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is Ephesians. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 4. There is a lot of provocation going on in families, and not only in families, but also in the church. People provoking each other. And as a father, how do you deal with your little ones? As a priest in church, as let me use the word as a pastor or um, as an elder in church, how do you deal with the little lambs who may be erring? Is it to point fingers at them? Is that what we should be doing? Is it pointing fingers or nurturing them in the right way? The word provoke here means to enrage. When a child sees the parent discipline or speak to them in anger and out of control, a child feels that they can manifest the spirit in retaliation. Never should a child be disciplined in anger. Never should an elder or a pastor react in anger with the church members. You show lack of constraint if you work out in such a manner. This is provoking the church members. This is provoking the children. And so the family circle teaches us how to deal with the church at um, a larger sphere. Proverbs 22.6 Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yeah, th there should be a training. There should be, And in training, you are so cautious in how you deal with the person because you are imparting traits that will be cultivated when these people come in the position that you are holding right now. If you are practicing kingly power upon your children, upon your wife, and upon the heritage of God in church, when they reach to such a position, if you are dealing with the young ones, and if they have a chance to be in the position you are in, they will practice the same spirit. And so we are looking at the kingly power and a uh, legal religion in our higher calling. How should you conduct your family at lunch? Uh, how should you conduct your family and then deal with the church? The way you will deal with the family is the way you should be dealing with the church. A religion of the heart is what is needed, not a kingly and a legalistic religion where people have to see things your way. Where people, when they see you, they have to fear so and so has ended in, in a place. Show confidence. This is... Uh, Manuscript uh, release, page 3, paragraph 3, and child guidance, also found in child guidance, page 33. Fathers and mothers, you have a solemn work to do. The eternal salvation of your children depends upon your course of action. How will you successfully educate your children? Not by calling, for it will do no good. Talk to your children as if you had confidence in their intelligence. Deal with them kindly, tenderly, lovingly. <clears throat> Tell them what God could have them to do. Tell them that God could have them, edu uh, have them educated and trained to be laborers together with him. When you act your part, you can trust the Lord to act his part. And uh, you look at Jesus Christ and how he dealt with the disciples. He is telling us something that he had practiced on his disciples. When James and John were sons of thunder, when Peter was too talkative, and when Judas was a traitor in the camp, how did Jesus Christ deal with this? And so fathers and mothers, we are being told not to treat people in a scolding manner. 
the children in a scolding manner because Christ himself, how he dealt with his erring disciples. And if you are a church leader, how should you deal with these erring ones? Should, should you uh, despise them? Should you scold them? Should, we, should you throw them out of your congregation? Is this how Christ dealt with his disciples when they were in their infancy? No, there should be a spirit of forbearance and patience and kindness and tender loving amongst those who are standing to lead the flock of the Lord. And so the family relation reveals unto us even a more striking point on how we should deal with the erring, not in a scolding manner. How, let the congregation cultivate a confidence with thee. Let them have a, a let, have, let them have trust that um, actually you can give them a chance because God is a God who gives us chances. Continue down. Husband and wife are closely united in their work in homeschool. They are to be very tender and, guard, and very guarded in their speech, lest they open a door of temptation through, through they are to be very tender and very guarded in their speech, lest they open a door of temptation through which Satan will enter to obtain victory after victory. They are to be kind and courteous to each other, acting in such a way that they can respect one another. Each is to help the other to bring into the home a pleasant, wholesome atmosphere. So, just as the family is not a one-man show, the church is not a one-man show. There should be a working together in harmony. There should be a pressing together among us those who are actually looking for Christ. And don't argue in front. There are even leaders who argue. There is a husband and wife who argue in front of children. There are leaders who argue in front of the congregation. This shouldn't be practiced. Just to bring out who is more knowledgeable than the other. You find someone saying this and another one find, saying this and they counter each other until the congregation becomes confused. This is also lack of the husband and wife at home actually uh, 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 having this spirit of listening to each other and discussing things. They, they want to be Mr. Right and Mr. Right. And at the end of the day, the children become confused. They see their parents arguing. And they go to the church, and the same spirit is manifested amongst the leaders and the elders of the church, so that the church is left in confusion and left siding with one or the other. There is always uh, a vision that is created at home. You find that the, pa the children are leaning on the side of the father or on the side of the mother, whichever they will, because of the situation they are seeing. You come to the church and you find that is the same thing that is happening, that after these uh, fracas and fractions in church, you will find that now the people are on this side of the elder and others are on the, on the side of the other elder or the pastor. And uh, so I'll pass over this. And uh, honesty. Honesty is one of the things that should be practiced. Yes, Child Guardian, page 154. You know the details of life. <clears throat> the strict, uh, strictest uh, principle of honesty are to be maintained. The deviation from perfect fairness in business deal may appear as a small thing in the estimation of some, but our Savior did not thus regard it. His words on this point are plain and explicit. He that is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. A man who will overreach his neighbor on a small scale will overreach in a large scale if the temptation is brought to bear, uh, to bear upon him. A false representation in a small matter is as much as a dishonesty in the sight of God as a falsity in a larger matter. Honesty should be, honesty should stamp every action of our lives. Yes, honesty should stamp every action of our lives, both in family circle and in church matters, but um, many are not honesty in their dealings and this uh, gives us a, a harder time even running the church affairs. One of the things I want to look at is uh, 
are noticing the skills of those that you are working on with. Look to see what skills your children have, what their abilities are in what areas. Encourage them in the pursuit of their God-given talents. Everyone has unique gift. Help each child to discover their gift. So in the home circle, you can study your child and see actually what is the child good in. Don't enforce the child to have something that they don't have. And so when you come back to the church, each member have their gift. As a person who is over the heritage of God, who is feeding the lambs and the sheep, as a shepherd, look at your church members. What gift do they excel in? And put each one in that position. Don't enforce people out of position. Don't enforce people to be in places where they can't work better. And you find many times this is what is happening in the church. And so the church is not growing because people are put in positions which they don't fit. Because even in family circles, the parents or the leaders in the family have not invested their time in investigating what the children are good at and encouraging them to do that. And so they turn the same spirit to the church and fail to guide the children in the guide the church in the right direction putting people where they should be and uh, we found that um, christ gave the gifts according to the measure of grace of faith that people had he didn't just say that now anyone can be an apostle anyone can be a prophet anyone can be a uh, uh, a pastor anyone can be a teacher or a miracle healer no he looked at um, uh mm -hmm at the capabilities that um, he sees in his children and then he gave them according to the measure of the spirit and so as the leaders in uh, such a time that we are living in we should be able to identify the skills and the talents of the people and put them in the right positions and encourage them to work so that the church may grow uh, uh, even uh, more faster. The lesson given Joseph in his youth by Jacob is in expressing his firm trust in God and letting to him again and again the precious evidence of his loving kindness and unceasing care were the very lessons he needed in his exile among an adulterous people. In the testing time, he put this lesson to a practical use. When under the severe trial, he looked to his heavenly father, whom he had learned to trust. Teach the people to trust in the Lord, not to trust in their talents. This is another mistake that we do. We, we teach people to look upon people. Cast is a man who actually uh, looks upon the people. And we should teach people in church as leaders to trust in the Lord, to always seek the Lord in everything, to seek God in prayer. And uh, then this will help us much. Coming to an end, we, are, we have been looking at the kingly power and the legal religion that is found amongst us this day, and we have been looking at it from the standpoint of a family. How you bring up your family will determine how you lead the church of God. What was the problem with the Pharisees? These are of ages 309, 310. The Pharisees claimed to be the children of Abraham and boasted are uh, boasted of their possession of the oracles of God, yet the yet these advantages did not uh, preserve them from selfishness, malignity, greed, if, uh, greed for gain, and the uh, the best basis basis of uh, hypocrisy. They thought themselves the greatest religionists of the world, but their so-called orthodox led them to crucify the Lord of Glory. The same danger still exists today. What is the spirit of Rome? What is the spirit of Rome? You need to see the Rome that the same way I do. If you did, you wouldn't be so unhealthy. Dress reform is so important. If you don't dress the right way, you are going to be lost. Don't you see that you are following the devil by not following what I know? Is true. This is the spirit of wrong. And what actually it ends up in is persecution of people who don't see the things the way you see them. It is a legal religion. 
a legal religion is insufficient to bring the soul in harmony with God. This hard, rigid orthodoxy of the Pharisee, destitute of contrition, tenderness of love, was only a stumbling block to sinners. We become stumbling blocks to sinners even today. They were like the soul that had lost its savor, for the influence had no power to preserve the world from corruption. The only true faith is that which worketh by love, Galatians 5, 6, to purify the soul. A legal and a kingly religion is a religion that is rigid, hard, and it is destitute of tenderness, of love. Let us not be found with such a kingly and a legal religion as we near the end of the times and we need to guide the children uh, 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 we need to guide the children of God. And so, when you look at these things, does the Sabbath truth and cruel harsh words go together? Does the sanctuary truth and angry impatient tones go together? Does the SOP and enforcing one idea down another's throat go together? When we combine truth with a lie, then we are sanctifying sin and not sanctifying righteousness. How I pray that um, a legal religion will not be found among us, those people who are waiting for Christ. A legal, kingly religion. This is not the religion of Christ. And we can learn better how to handle the church by practicing the things we want at home life. If you can bring up your family in the right way, then you will be able even to rule over the church. For when the leaders of the church were being elected, they were to be good rulers of their own houses and to their children. For if you can't rule well your own family, how can you be entrusted with the church of God to lead it? And so I pray that we'll be helped with this presentation and God will help us to reach the higher calling that we have received as shepherds of the Lord, of, of the Lord and his church. We can close up with our of prayer, please. Our Father, we come unto you this morning again. We thank you so much for the time that you have enabled, enabled us to share this word with your people, those who are watching, those who will watch later. Lord, we pray that you may Help us that we may be possessed with the spirit of humility, the spirit of love, the spirit of gentleness, and even of peace. Help us not to exercise kingly powers everywhere, in the every atmosphere where we find ourselves. But we may be humble as little children, for this is the only way we can even possess the kingdom of heaven. May you forgive us because we have been leading in this way before, and now that we have known the truth, May we follow it with all the heart and help us to do according to your will. And we pray that this morning you may forgive us our sins and lead us into our daily activities. For this our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. And, uh...